Okay. So, what does it say there? You're richer than you think. This statement is sponsored by all of your children, especially at Christmas time. Okay? So, you got to splurge. You got, you know, you're richer than you think. Just get the presents. Don't complain about it. Okay. Good. No. You're richer than you think. That's important. Because, you know, even the, the Scotia Bank tells us that. <laughs> but, uh, and they've got ten reasons why. They, uh, a litany provided there. A list of things to understand why you're richer than you think. And that's good to know. Financially, but it's much more important to know that uh, for the Christian, spiritual riches have been lavished upon the believer that we need to know about. Um, knowing your position in Christ, uh, that is the teaching of the book of Ephesians with an important reason for that. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians. So it's important to know, you're not what you think you are. Before we think about who we are in Christ, you need to be reminded you're not who you think you are or perhaps who people think you are. Let me give this example. There was a drill sergeant, and this drill sergeant, well, he barked out an order to a bunch of recruits. You, you dumbbells, get moving! All but one obeyed. Angered by his seeming defiance, the sergeant marched up to him and growled, Well? The younger crew replied, There certainly were a lot of them, sir. Jesus said in John chapter 8. 
And you see, how is she going to understand more about who this one is that said that? Even though she referred to him as Lord. And I realize some of your Bibles may have said sir as a respective term. But it was more probably, uh, should be interpreted as Lord, as a term of reverence. And she said, Lord, no one, no one stood here. No, everyone's gone. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. She must have left and kind of thought, who is this one? How can I know more about him? Perhaps you're a believer here this morning, and you're at the point where you're saying, I want to know more about who Jesus is, my relationship with him. In fact, we should all be here because of that, because we don't know it all. We haven't been there and done that, and there's no more to learn and grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So this morning, we need to be encouraged. What, G what Paul is writing to the believers here in Ephesians, so that we can appreciate today and apply to our lives. The book of Ephesians is a follow-up letter, so to speak, to explain <coughs> some of uh, the, great, uh, the great doctrines of Christianity. <clears throat> and that is why it is highly praised and prized by so many commentators. Ephesians has been called the queen of the epistles. So as we consider these opening verses, we're going to notice a key statement in them. I'm going to read the first 14 verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God the holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, let me stop right there. The Apostle Paul, in writing to these believers in Ephesus, how does he refer to them? I want to begin by considering how he refers to them. God's holy people. You see, the riches of the saints. Paul's pronouncement to the believers. His pronouncement to the believers is he refers to them as saints. Now, I know in some uh, denominations, in order to, be, uh, to receive that term saint, you'd have to be dead for so many years, and you'd have to do something incredibly impressive, at least from man's perspective, that you could be dubbed saint. Mm -hmm. Whereas Paul's writing to the living. He's writing to ordinary folk, so to speak, but are unique in another sense, and that is because their position as believers in Jesus Christ. You see, that word saints or holy ones means to be set apart. Hagios is the Greek word. And the idea is these individuals are set apart. They're set apart to God. They're set apart for God. And they're separated from the world in their position as Christians. They're unique. They're different. So in other words, in the biblical sense, the most obscure is just as much a saint as the Apostle Paul. Paul doesn't put himself on a higher level. Though he refers to himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he says that's by the will of God. That's not something I invented. That's his office, that's his work that God has entrusted to him as a believer. But that doesn't make him more important, nor does being an apostle make him a believer. Making him a believer is what makes each and every one of us a believer, is placing our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So you see, that should give the believers hope right there. Wow, I'm a saint. When's the last time you thought about that? I'm a saint. Don't get too puffed up. <laughs> that's, that's because of what God has done for you. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Hallelujah. I'm a saint. But it's also important to know is that Paul refers to them as saints. Now, Paul doesn't refer to them as sinners. He refers to them as saints. That's a good way that we should consider one another as well. 
When we think of brothers and sisters in the Lord, we think of God's people. We think of them as saints, as holy ones, because of what Christ has done for them, and because they belong to the family of God. So that helps us to level the ground. No one's more important than the other. Paul's writing to the saints who are in Christ Jesus. God's holy people in Ephesus. And then he goes on to write, <coughs> Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a pronouncement by way of introduction. Paul wants to, write, as he writes to these believers here, He's not, these are not words of condemnation, are they? Just as Jesus said to that woman, neither do I condemn you. These are not words of criticism. By way of introduction, these are words of, com these are complimentary words, encouraging words. And that's how we should approach one another. And that's how we should think of what God has done for us. He's made us saints because of who He is. Great confidence before the Lord. That would, that would leave me with a certain degree of confidence if someone approached me like that. For example, if when you accomplish something great, very important, doesn't that give you a sense of confidence? Just by that term of being referred to as a saint? Just this past week, as you are well aware, I drove out west, out west with my son and... Uh, why was I driving out west? Because my son worked hard for the last few years in, in the trade of, of plumbing. He did all of the required testing as well as the hours spent to accomplish a goal. And he reached it recently when he was given a red seal, which means the government recognized and approved the accomplishment there. And he's deemed a full-fledged plumber and that he's recognized by companies all over Canada and around the world because of this. Except here in Quebec. <laughs> That's an issue for another day. <laughs> I'm not going to go into the realm of politics. <laughs> However, uh, you know, when he reached that, as soon as he reached that goal, you know what he did? He started to apply positions. And he got one out west. They hired him. They, they checked out uh, all of his, uh, his resume, they talked to him and had the interview and everything, and they said, you come on out, we've got a job for you. The confidence that he had because of that accomplishment gave him a boost, changed his perspective, his attitude. It gave, a, gave him a bounce in his step, so to speak. Now, why am I saying that? Is because when God looks at us, he sees not a sinner. He sees a saint, saved by his son. That should do something to you and I. It's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but it's by his mercy that he saved us. But that should still give us a bounce in our step, a joy in our hearts. What God has done for us, we're different, we're special. The Ephesians needed to hear this. You're saints. You may be going through a difficult time. You're a saint. You may think God has abandoned you. You're a saint, and He hasn't. You may think that you're losing this battle, but you're on the winning side. You're a saint. God will never leave you nor forsake you. So, even in these opening verses, the, by way of introduction, I believe Paul has, an, has encouraged the believers. But we're not done there, we're just beginning. And uh, this chapter is just filled with uh, truths to encourage the believers here at Ephesus. Not only so, but we see of the spiritual blessing, the riches the Father uh, has accomplished for these believers. We're also going to, going to consider not only the Apostle Paul, but what God the Father has done in the placement of the saints. Look at the next few verses. Verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every 
spiritual blessing in Christ. Just to be, uh, just by way of reminder, these are what kind of blessings? Spiritual blessings. I'm not talking when I say you're richer than you think. Financial blessings. I don't know how things are going to work out financially for you or for me. That's not the purpose of Paul's writing here to say that you're all going to be healthy and wealthy. He's saying your, your blessings are spiritual in nature. Blessed, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Look at the word in Christ. That little term in Christ is used no less than 40 times in these six chapters. No less than 40 times. Either in Christ or of Christ, but because of Christ. In Christ, you have all of these blessings. So the question that you and I and everyone has to ask themselves, wow, well, do I have these blessings? Well, are you in Christ? That's the condition. Look at the father there when he decided to make this decision concerning the believers. Verse 4, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. What words do we read again? For he chose us in him. When? Before he created the heavens and the earth. That long ago, the creation of the world. What does that mean, he chose us in him? Now, there's a few different views that I would like us to consider this morning. He chose us in him. Does that mean he chose us randomly, arbitrarily, before he even created the heaven and the earth, that he would choose some to be believers? That's one view. Another view is that God chose us to believe before he created the heavens and the earth because he looked down the corridor of time and he saw that we want to believe in him, therefore he provided a way so that we could believe in him and we could become believers. Both those views I reject. Biblically, I believe there's another view and that is God, God planned that the church would be placed in Christ. Believers would find their salvation, all of the blessings in Christ. And that was God's purpose and God's plan. And he did that. It wasn't a last minute, you know, uh, Johnny come lately type of thought that God had. Last minute, oh boy, how are these people going to believe? I know, I'll send Jesus. Jesus was planned, his body was planned and prepared before heavens were made and the earth was made that he would be the savior and that all and that the church would find their salvation in him. That's what God planned and prepared. That's what he chose his son to uh, be the savior and that all those who are found in Christ are chosen because of that. For example, let me illustrate it this way. May, yesterday I flew home from Calgary. Now, that flight was planned a long time ago by Air Canada that on Saturday at 7.15 in the morning I would fly back from Calgary to Montreal. When did I actually enjoy the benefits of that, even though it was planned a long time ago, is when I got into the plane. It said Air Canada on it. Now let's just change, use different words. Just say, let's use the word, it's not Air Canada, but it's called chosen. It's called chosen. You see, Air Can the, the, the chosen airline planned that long before I ever got into it. I benefited from it only when I entered into that plane. And then by default, by extension I should say, I am now seen as chosen. Why? Because I am in the chosen, the plane, which is flying from Calgary 
to uh, Montreal. And in the same way, Christians today are chosen in Christ. Notice, that's, notice it doesn't say chosen to become a Christian. It says the Christians are chosen to be in Christ. God, the Christians have to find their place of salvation, and that was planned before the foundations of the world were even laid and created. So that's how long ago um, God planned this salvation for the believers that they would find their satisfaction in Jesus Christ. And what, what does that mean for you and I? Well, I remember when I, somebody first started to tell me about Jesus Christ and who he was and all of this. I could have thought at that moment, this guy's telling me something new. I've never heard of this before. And I could have just ignored it because it's just, you know, another cult, another religious thing like all the others. But no, no. You see, Paul in writing to the Ephesians is saying, Jesus is not this last moment, last, last kind of urgent need that I gave to the world. It was planned before the foundations of the world that God would provide a Savior for the church and the church would be blessed in Him. So we can be encouraged as well that this is not something new. And because if we look at chapter 2, you see there would be a lot of... Uh, remember at this time there was the Jews and there were the Gentiles. But they both found their salvation in none other than Jesus Christ. And there would be friction at this point during the church age, as is, st is stated there in chapter 2 and verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision, that's the Jews. Remember that at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see, this would be telling also the nation of Israel that, no, these, these Gentile believers, it's, it's not as if they're inventing this last minute. This was something that was, the salvation was something that was planned before God created the heavens and the earth, that we would be saved in His Son. You're not saved by being related to Abraham. You're not saved by being related to Moses, even though they were before them. They were not before Christ. Christ was before them. And so that was important for these two groups to realize. That salvation is found in no other name, and God planned it before the heavens and the earth were laid. So that would, the placement of the saints is important. The placement of the saints to believe. Who was the one that was chosen before the foundations of the earth? That's stated clearly in 1 Peter and chapter 2. Or excuse me, chapter 1 where it says, look what it says. In verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 1. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the foundation of, uh, before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last days. So you see, Christ is the, the one who was chosen. He is the primary choice of God for salvation. On a secondary level, because we are in Christ, we are chosen as well. Because God sees us in His Son who was chosen. When were we chosen? Then. Look what it says in verse 13. It tells us. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Not only so, when you believe. That's when you were chosen. When you believe. Not in eternity past that God picked you. 
That was the plan of, of the place. That's talking in Ephesians 1 4, it's talking about the placement. It's not talking about son making, because it never says you were chosen to believe. It's talking about son placing. God decided in eternity past where the believers would be placed. And that's in his son. And so we see that the opportunity is the same for everyone. God just does not randomly pick certain people to believe and the rest. He says, now, for whatever reason, I love them, but not enough, not enough to pick them. Um, so it's up to the individual to respond to the gospel call to surrender their lives to Christ. And that message is available to the whole world. The last time I read John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his own, one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that is the opportunity available for you and I, uh, for the world. And we need to be encouraged that God has a special uh, place uh, place for us in his son. And we're, when that was planned out was in eternity past. But we can think of God and how, why he did this. Look what it says. He did it in love. So we see the father in his placement of the saints. But we also see that he did it in love. Look what it goes on to say in verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. This is what he planned for us. To be blameless and in his sight. To be holy and blameless in his sight. That's the purpose of the salvation too that he's promised for us. That he's given to us. To be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us. He predetermined that God, we would be found in Christ, and he predetermined that he will bring it to completion, that we have not received the full benefits of our salvation, our adoption. We won't receive that until when? When we're redeemed, when we're brought into the presence of God. If we look at Romans chapter 8, look what it says here. It's a lot of teaching, man. Okay, Romans chapter 8. Look what it says in verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly, he's writing to believers, for our adoption to sonship, which is the redemption of our bodies. So the adoption here is referring to the completion when we are with God in heaven. The riches of God is seen in the Father's plan and the Father's purpose, but also in the Son's procurement. In other words, God's, God had a plan for His Son, and the Son was in agreement with it, and so was the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Godhead, before in eternity past, but now the Son had to follow through on it. And how did He follow through on this? Look what it says in verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 1. That's how we follow through it. That's how we are purchased and born into the family of God. And what does it say there? In Him we have redemption through His blood. That's the procurement. Is that it's through His blood. We have been lavished with the riches of Christ, but it came at a high cost. Yesterday when I was flying, there was an announcement over the uh, intercom. We want to recognize, it said, they said, a girl said, that this is the 11th, and we want to remember the fallen soldiers who in past wars have given their lives for our freedoms. And so there was even an announcement over the plane, <clears throat> flying back. We need to, we need to remember that. You know, and of course some of you still have your poppies, and yesterday, I did have one, Kevin and I had one, but I don't have it today, I think I lost it somewhere, but it was to remember what the fallen have done, so that that would procure our freedoms, all of our benefits that we enjoy here in Canada, and in other parts of the free world, 
is because somebody paid the price for that. You see, for our spiritual freedom, which is forgiveness of sins, to be born in the family of God, somebody had to pay for that. It came at a high cost and price. And it came through the blood of Jesus Christ, who bled and died on that cruel cross. <coughs> so when we think of the riches, we need to think of the price that was paid and who paid for it, even though the plan was an eternity past. Remember what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? If it, was, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus was talking about the, the cup of suffering and death and separation from his Father on the cross. But he knew that there was only one way that the payment for sin could be made, and that was through himself. That should give us encouragement that God saw our need. God saw our need in eternity pass. And his son paid the price for it. Freedom and liberty came at a great price. And so this morning, we are blessed. We are richer than we think. How often do we really think of the plan of God? How often do we think of the price that was paid? Or how often do we even think of the pledge that was made? My time is quickly passing by in Ephesians chapter 1. There's books been written on just these few verses. So I apologize for not getting through it quicker, but even now I'm not doing justice to the scriptures as I'm trying to plow through it. And I didn't want to get through the first 14 verses. But you see, we can't truly walk with God daily until we appreciate what we have in Christ. We can't spend the riches until we know the riches that we have in Christ. And so, the Apostle Paul writing to the church and the believers here, he's trying to get across to them how special they are to God. That, they may be, that God may use them. And this is all for God's glory and God's purpose. As it says in here and... Uh, uh, at, in verse 10, to play, verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will. You know what the mystery of his will is in verse 9? The mystery of his will that was hidden in the ages past was that Jesus Christ would be the Savior and that he would pay the punish, punishment for our sins. They knew of it to a certain degree because of the prophecies and Isaiah 53 was led like a lamb to the slaughter and all of these things. But they didn't fully understand that God, His Son, would pay the price on the cross. It was hidden, even though it was planned in eternity past. Previous uh, generations prior to the cross didn't understand the full ramifications of what that meant. It was, but now it had been revealed to them, and it's revealed to us, it's revealed to the world that salvation is offered in and through Jesus Christ. It's been made known. In him, look what it says, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purposes of his will. Everything centers around his son, and the cross, and the Savior, everything, past, present, and future, every knee will bow, past, present, and future, everything revolves around His Son, and to think that we belong to God, because we are found in Christ, because we believe the message after we heard it, we were placed in Christ. Wonderful promises. And why am I saying this by way of introduction? Because this book, and I encourage you to read it, will deal with every relationship that we have here on planet Earth with people. Whether it's a marital relationship, whether it's a working relationship, whether it's a, uh, a neighborly relationship, all these different relationships, it's taught us, God teaches us how to live not simply what to know in theology, but how to live our lives in, in practicality as believers. So we'll have a, even a, a session on marriage enrichment. Did, did you know that, Nix? You are the guest speaker. <laughs> uh, 
All right. <coughs> Things to, maybe we'll hear a testimony or two. But um, Ephesians is deep in theology, but it has to be met with practicality, mm. or else it's just lofty sayings with no real meat to the bone, so to speak. And as God's children, <laughs> we want to give God the glory too, because that's what it says here. Uh, it's all for His glory. And so, look what it says in verse 12. In order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory. And of course, Paul was writing to the Ephesians back then. That was the first generation of believers. But even us today, we want our lives to be for the praise of His glory. And finally, the, proc the procurement uh, we talked about, but also there's the pledge, and it says there, what is the pledge? The promise of, for the riches. And you also, as I read, believed after you heard the message, and so on and so forth. When you believed, in verse 13, you were marked in Him with the seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit. So that identifies us, the Holy Spirit identifies us with God the Father identifies us that we belong to Christ, that we, were, we are in Christ. What three things do we see here in these opening verses is the three persons of the Godhead. I mentioned the Father. He planned the way. The Son, He paid for it. And we see the Holy Spirit. He's the promise that we belong to Christ. And that everything that God has promised will come to fruition in our lives. Look what it says. Who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession to the praise of His glory again. So we see how much is offered to the believer, how much we have in Christ Jesus. The question is, have we wrapped our arms around it? Have we, do we hold on to the riches that God has promised in here through this writing as Paul's writing to the Ephesians. It's true of believers today. Let me share this in conclusion. The story of the husband and wife helping in a ministry. The, the uh, husband writes this. When I was, when my wife and I lived in Honduras, we spent part of our time helping a ministry called Amor Y Vida, which means love and life. Amor Y Vida. This ministry acted as an orphanage and hospice because the people who lived there were children who had cancer and had been abandoned by their family. While we were there, a group of uh, youth ministers from the States came down. Before they came, we asked them to bring, bring toys for the children. <laughs> Something in some way similar to what we're going to do doing with the Operation Christmas Child. It was like Christmas. The youth ministers came with toy cars, electronic games, and stuffed animals. We told the kids, about 25 of them, that they could pick one gift each. They all walked up together to these gifts, and every one of them, including the teenage boys, took a stuffed animal and left other toys behind. You see, they just wanted something to hold. That's all they wanted was something to hold that they could identify with, that comfort them, comforted them. Ephesians 1 in these verses here are meant so that the believer <coughs> would take hold of them. Take hold of these truths that God has stated here. If we can't take hold of these and we start reading in Ephesians chapter 4 where the real practical stuff begins, We'll say, why? For what reason? Doesn't mean that I just want to go on with my life. My life. <laughs> That's okay. That part's okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, that leaves us in the position of saying, what are we going to do with these uh, promises? What it means to be in Christ. What a privilege it is that we need to take to heart. And so from here we can move forward into the next few verses. And from there into the next chapter. And from there into the next chapter. And we're going to be excited as we go through this book uh, and see how we're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
But it begins with the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and knowing him more. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for the promises of your word. What it means to be found in Christ. Lord, it's, a, it's in some ways a very deep subject. Very, um, very complex in one degree. But yet, Lord, your spirit can reveal to us all the blessings and promises. All the... Uh, preparation that you made in eternity past even to procure our salvation. And you've even given us the promised Holy Spirit you've entrusted to us. We thank you for all that we have in Christ. Lord, teach us to know you more, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and to go from here experiencing a closer walk with you that will make an impact not only upon our lives, but those around us. So we thank you for your goodness and your grace and our time together in Jesus' name.